morning and welcome everyone to this webinar on power supply design essentials. We're talking to you from the new Ridley Works office in Camarillo, California. And hope everybody out there is safe and healthy and doing well. And we're going to have some fun this morning. Um, I'm going to dispense with any introductions here and just show you what we're going to do. We've got lots of fun things on my bench here. We've got some power supplies, normal power supplies, some little demo power supplies. We've got some Dan. And we've got some crazy power supplies to be looking at later on. So we're going to talk about all of that. Um, some logistics for you. The title of my talk here is Power Supply Essentials, but um, we're going to be first thing you're going to do. Hopefully, most of you have already downloaded our demo software. And this is a full design software for buck converters. And even today, with all the topologies around, there's more buck converters built than anything else. And it can be a very complex process just designing the simple buck converter. So this is why I think of this as the essential of power supply design. If you don't know how to design a buck, you really don't know how to design any of them. And this is a very interesting time in our field right now. There's more going on than ever before. So we have new controllers, new devices, new topologies, which aren't necessarily that new, but uh, new pe people are using them in different ways. And we've got very new demands on the power converter, demands for performance and efficiency and size that just haven't been there before. Finally, people are taking the power supply very seriously as the rest of the power electronics is shrinking the power supply has a lot more pressure on it to follow along with that. So please, if you haven't already, please download this demo version of the software, install that if you can, probably too late now to, to follow along if you haven't already done that, but you can certainly do that afterwards. And we will be monitoring questions here. So it'll be hopefully an interactive uh, session where you can ask questions and we'll stop and flag the big questions when they come in and then I will I will answer those. So feel feel free to be you know a big part of this uh, seminar, ask your questions, we can head in different directions a little bit, but of course we only have one hour to finish everything. Um, while you're sitting there watching, you have a little craft project to do here. And here on the second page of the presentation, you have two objects, one here, there's a little rectangular box for you to build. It'll look like this when you're done. And this here, cut out along this hashed line here and around the circle. And you're going to make yourself a little uh, trash can there out of that. And you're going to see what that's for later. It's part of the learning process. Hopefully, you all follow along. We had a couple of Americans uh, you know, from our Facebook group earlier asking if they should bring some glitter as well. If you want to put the glitter on the trash can, you feel free to go ahead and, and do that. That would be fun. Okay. Sound okay? Right. Let's talk about bug converter designs. And I'm not going to do PowerPoint. We're going to go into design software. And here is your Ridley Works design software, which hopefully many of you are now running on your computers. This is a piece of software that has been in development for over 30 years now. Um, it's an Excel spreadsheet. It doesn't look like an Excel spreadsheet and it behaves not like an Excel spreadsheet. It will do a lot of powerful design for you. It is not designed as a simulator. There's plenty of simulators out there. There's PTIM, LT Spice, P Spice, Simplis, many, many out there. There are very, very few pieces of design software that actually help tell you how to do the design. And this is a difficult part of the education process these days. And we, we, we kind of found this out uh, when we ran an intern program a couple of years ago over the summer 
we had four very, very bright PhD students from around the world, all with amazing analytical skills. None of them knew how to start the design of a simple buck converter because they wanted to see equations. They wanted to see logical flow process for doing this. And it's not that, it's a creative process. There is so much going on in this field today with the different devices we have and the different say, topologies, controllers, the options that we have that I don't think anybody definitively knows how to design anymore. There's so many options that we have to pick and choose and there's a lot of experimentation that has to go on when you're designing a power converter. And that's something that's not really taught in school. It's taught as a closed form event. And in power conversion, it's really not that kind of kind of thing. Let's begin design. Start here. Just looking uh questions. Everything's okay. Rules of thumb, yes. Crossover frequency, gain margin, phase margin. We're not really doing control in this webinar. We'll have another webinar later on about control, but I'll try to touch on that when we when we get to it. So let's start with the specifications of a converter. And if you click on specifications there, that blue button, the screen will pop up. And this is a 36 to 60 volt input, nominal 48 volt input to a 12 volt output, 10 amps. And we chose this specification deliberately because there was recently a little app note that came out from EPC doing a design of a buck converter in this range. And it's very common to knock down that 48 down to 12 volts, then getting ready for point load converters. But this is just a, a, a typical application for 120 watts. And what we want to do now is, is to figure out how we start designing the converter for this. So we have a program that's going to design it for you. And when you click OK here, you can see the program is thinking a little bit. Hopefully, you can all follow along with this. There's a question, Ray, which I find. Question there? Yeah. The crossover question? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we'll get to the crossover frequency question a little bit later when we do the control of the converter. But the first design point of a buck converter is what should the switching frequency be? And here's a, here's a 120 watt power converter. And our program is picking up. 144 kilohertz for that. So where does that come from? Well, everybody's asked us over the years, you know, can, can we have the equations for doing this? So sure, here's some equations. Let's uh, jump back to our PowerPoint here for just a second. And here's our first question. What's your switching frequency? Well, basically, under the cookbook rules of doing power supply design, which is the starting point, Here's our formula inside the program. We're going to be above 40 kilohertz for the kind of power we do, up to a kilo, kilowatt or so is most of our power. We're going to be less than 300 kilohertz. Why do we put that bound on it? Because we want to design something that you're going to get into production quickly and it's going to work. You start going above 300 kilohertz, you have to work a lot harder to make that work. And uh, it's a logarithmic function here. As the power goes up, frequency goes down. So there's an equation for you. All of you who love your little MathCAD files and uh, whatever designers that you use, go ahead, plug it in, and it'll get you started in a power supply design. That's our first rule. What's our second rule? So we start with the frequency, and we're going to have a lot of discussion about this frequency because I don't think anybody really knows anymore what that frequency should be. But here's a start point. And then you move around that start point, but you have to start somewhere. Next point, inductor value for ripple current comes in. So there you go. We, we choose in the program nominally, it's a peak to peak ripple current of 30% of the load current. And again, we're gonna talk about that later. There's nothing hard and fast about that rule, but you got to start somewhere to get things going. How do we design that? And let's just go back to the program again. So after we've chosen the switching frequency, and now notice, I know engineers, and over the year, if you tell them this should be your switching frequency, 
they immediately leave your program because they want control. So you have control. You can type in your own switching frequency here. Some people will choose 100 kilohertz. Some people will choose 132 is a common number. Some people choose 150. Generally tends to be constrained into those values. Interesting, this number hasn't really changed for about uh, for the 30 years that I've been doing power supply design. This number really hasn't moved significantly except for some extreme power supplies that are being designed. And we'll talk more about that a little later. Okay. Here's the topologies that are available to you in our full software. Demo software just has the buck. That's what we're using today. And you click OK. All right. So what we have now is a full converter here. Here's the power stage with the L and the C, the diode and the switch, controller, feedback network, input voltage, input capacitor. Everything has been designed for you. So you can immediately jump from specifications to simulation. So here is simulation of the startup of the power converter. Starts at zero volts, ramps up, overshoots a little bit, comes in and regulates at 12 volts. If you want to continue that simulation, this is, let's see, six milliseconds of simulation at 144 kilohertz. I believe that's 800 cycles of simulation. Click continue. Right here, there's another 800 cycles. Built into this program is the world's fastest simulator. But as I said before, we're not specifically a simulator because we can't simulate arbitrary circuits. We've got a set of circuits we can simulate. But the whole point of this is to design through simulation not through equations. We use the equations to start, but then we're going to massage the design around according to the simulator. So we don't want to jump out to SPICE or PSIM or anything that is going to slow down this design process. And we're going to see how fast that part is in just a, a, a little while. So there's the output voltage. It's a, it's a nice cap on here. It's a multi-layer ceramic type cap. So 300 microhenries. 308, of course, doesn't exist. You might go in and say, okay, let's use 330 there. Update with the 330 microfarads. Question about switching frequency. Anyway. Question about switching frequency. EMI limits worth saying yes. EMI limits, that some limits change. They don't start at 150 kilohertz. They change. So there's a ramp down in the curve, and then it drops at 150 kilohertz. Okay. Now, if you're going to constrain yourself to be below 150 kilohertz, um, you're going to live in the 1980s for switching power supply design. So if you go above 150 kilohertz, the limits are lower. Design a better filter. That's all you have to do. So don't be afraid of that limit. And in many cases, actually, you know, that, that is, is put out there as the reason why everything stays low. And some of this comes, I, I know, from power integrations. They, they do a lot of parts that are there. But the, the real reason is that it's difficult to start going higher than that. 200 kilohertz, you know, you're going to build a really dense power supply compared to 130. That is more difficult. You go to 300, you go to 400, you go to 500. And then you find you can't really build a part like the power integrations part that can operate there reliably for every application that people are going to put in. So, so yes, I see people limiting their frequencies, but you know, we're going to push those limits out of the way in the in the second half of this presentation. But for now, conventional power supply, we're going to live in that region as well. So where are we here? We're talking about the cap. So. The design process, design sequence, if you click this button here, you get the design sequence. With the input cap, that's just bypass caps. Then you get the control parameters right here. And that really is the switching frequency, the current limit, the references you're going to use, and so on. Now, notice at this point, we're not choosing an IC. Okay, so we're not going to a TI or an on semi or whoever and, and picking up their controller which is the starting point for most of the semiconductor companies. For us, we think the power converter is about designing the passives, the transformers, the L and the C and the layout. 
and the switches and the diodes or rectifiers. And when you're done with all that, that's the power converter. It's like at that point, let's go look at the controllers out there, which one can handle it for us. I don't start with a controller, I finish with a the controller. There are now thousands of controllers on the market, digital, analog, cross between the two, all kinds out there. The cho choice of the controller is not critical. It's got to work with the power stage, but it's not the starting point for the power stage. Now, so here we go. Here's our controller generically. Later on, we can fill that in with a real controller if we want to. Let's go back to waveforms and simulation. So the next thing we're looking at is the ripple current in the inductor. So here now you see a blur of ripple. This is our time base, just like a scope. Push these buttons to turn the dial and you expand in on the ripple current of the converter. So here you can see we've got about three amps of ripple current for a 10 amp output, which is just you know our starting point for the design. Here's our inductor, 22.2 microhenries. So how's this converter doing? Well, let's take a quick look now at the efficiency. Okay. Efficiency of this converter, buck converter running 144 kilohertz is 94%. Now, when I started power converter design, in the early 80s, if we could get 94%, we would have been very happy. But that doesn't cut it anymore because we're trying to squeeze the density down. So 94% for a buck, it's, it's just kind of a mediocre converter. Sometimes it doesn't matter. You've got lots of power available. You've got lots of cooling available. You just want to get on with it. You want to build it as simply as you can. How can we change that efficiency? Well, where's our losses? We've got semiconductor conduction losses, five watts, 0.5 in the switching losses, winding losses, the magnetics, and a little bit of core loss in the magnetics. So most of our loss is in the semiconductors. Let's go look at those. Here's your switch design. 54 milliohms in the switch and the total loss in the power switch is 2.4 watts, of which 1.9 is conduction loss. Okay, and that's about where we design. We start our design, the, the beginning choice of the switch is like, okay, put about 1% loss in there. That'll be a reasonably sized size switch. That's another of our design rules. If we want to change the efficiency, we want to make it a little better. We know that the big loss part is actually the diode. See, the diode here has 3.3 watts. Because, can you turn the AC? Sorry, gale force blowing my hair here. <laughs> we have a 0.49 volt drop on the, on the diode. And of course, every uh, self-respecting uh, buck converter these days is a synchronous rectifier. How do we turn this to a synchronous rectifier? We just put in a nice low value in here one millivolt, and then you put in, let's say, the same FET as we're using for the power switch. Update, 3.5, well, that's not so good. Let's go 20 milliohms. There you go, now we're taking this number down. Can you get a 10 milliohm FET? Sure you can, 10 milliohm FET, update. Okay, 0.6 watts, look okay. To our efficiency, now we're up to 96% efficiency. Okay, so we're doing better. Is that good? Well, there's converters out there trying to do 98, 99, 99.5% efficiency. Depends how much money you want to spend on the parts to make that a little better. Okay, let's go have a little go at our switch as well. Let's make this also 10 milliohms. Update. And now you see we're up to, oops, didn't update that one. I wonder why that didn't update. Update switch. 
something that's not happy. Oh, 10 ohms, that's not gonna work. <laughs> Zero, one, update. And let's go simulation and continue, get it back into regulation. So something to note about this program, when we estimate our efficiency, this is not a big MathCAD spreadsheet calculating this waveform, that waveform, that waveform. It runs a simulation. It looks at the simulation, analyzes the first waveform. That's where efficiency comes from. So now let's go check on that. Efficiency now is 97.5. Okay. So sorry for the hiccup there. This is what happens when we do live software. I put in 10 ohms instead of 10 milli ohms for the for the FET there. So we're getting up there in terms of efficiency on this converter. So what we've designed at this point is we did the switching frequency, the ripple current, and now the capacitor. How do you choose the capacitor? Remember the inductor capacitor, this is the big stuff that we're choosing these days. When you look at a power supply, the finished power supply, right here, there's the inductor, there's all the capacitors, that's the big stuff, okay? Control, it doesn't matter, it lives over here, a little tiny speck on the, on the board. We're looking at the L and the C, how can we minimize those in our designs? So you choose the output cap for ripple current capacity, you choose it for the resonant frequency, the classic rules are that the resonant frequency of the filter should be about 1 50th of the switching frequency. Otherwise, we're gonna start running into some, you know, little complications with control. And then the last thing we choose the capacitor based on is step load capacity. So let's go back here and look at control design. Look at our loop. You are using voltage mode control. And notice that the version of software we have actually talks to you and tells you where your control is will warn you about phase margins and so on. So here we have flat gain our converter. Here's our resonant frequency. If we click on power stage details, it tells you it's at 1.8 kilohertz. So that's almost one hundredth of the switching frequency. So that's following the classic rules. We should be less than one fiftieth of the switching frequency when we're choosing the cap. So that's the second rule. We've got enough capacitance there to absorb the ripple current. It's only about three amps into 330 microfarads of multi-layer ceramics. It's obeying the resonant frequency versus the switching frequency, which is out here. But the third thing we have to check into our waveforms is how is it going to perform with the step load? So let's turn the time base down to zero, down to the lowest right there. And then we're going to do a 10% to 100% step load. Okay. And you can see here now we're trying to regulate at 12 volts. And when we do that big step load, we're overshooting to 12.5 here, undershooting to about 11.5. So it's somewhat symmetrical, but not completely, because there's a lot going on with the simulation here. So you can't just do a small signal analysis and say, hey, when I go 10% to this percent, you just multiply by the small signal models. No, you have to do a large signal simulation. Because if we click on this button, we can see voltage and current. We can see here, we're actually in discontinuous mode with our current, hence the slow response time. And then here, when we step the current to the high value, we actually run into current limit on the converter. So that's a nonlinear event. This is a nonlinear event then we come in and regulate again. So there's a lot going on in this step load. Now we're getting down to the nitty gritty of how that cap is chosen. So let's just go back to the voltage waveform again. How do we reduce that peak on the voltage waveform? Question for the red line flags. Switching last question? Yeah. yeah, I'll get to that in just a second. Keep that one flagged for me. Yep, so let's fix the vertical. And what we're gonna do now, to decrease the overshoot, we can wind up the output cap. So there's 330, there's 396, almost 400. Now we're cutting it down. Let's suppose, let's pretend our spec is 200 millivolts overshoot. Okay, there you go. So you're gonna need about a thousand microfarads 
if you want to obey a 200 millivolt overshoot. That's how we choose the cap. So your, your application may not have any step load. You may not need that much, okay? What's going on in the simulator here? Well, we're changing the capacitor. You say, well, I could do that in PSIM or LTSPICE or whichever program you have. It's like, yeah, but there's more to it than that. Every time you change the cap, you've changed the resonant frequency, you've changed the gain of the power stage. So you have to change the cap, recompensate the loop for the new cap, run the simulation again. So every time I click here, I'm doing that. I'm redesigning the loop for each new value of capacitor. And there's our original value. So now we're seeing the true effect of adding more cap. If you just add cap and you freeze the compensation, then you're going to get about the same response because the gain is going to push down every time you add cap. So this is the power of our program. We can change these parameters on the fly here, recompensate the loop, and you're really doing the design. Now when I go and I build my prototype with that, you know, it's going to take you a few weeks or months to build the board, close the loop, and find out what the step load response is. But we've already done it. We know where you're going to end up in this. Okay, that's choosing the cap value. Let me get to one of those questions now. Somebody asked switching loss. So we look at our switch here. And we've got rise times, fall times. That should say fall time there. Sorry about that. There's a misprint there. Should say fall time. And the output capacitance of the FET. And there's turn on switching loss, turn off switching loss, and then there's capacitor discharge loss in the converter. Now I've been looking at uh, switching loss calculations of converters for many, many years, and Dr. Vorperian wrote a great paper on that a long time ago. And the bottom line is nobody really knows what the switching loss is. You have an approximation. And this is a reasonable approximation, but the, the, the turn on of the channel of a FET and the inductances that are in there, the capacitances in there, and the way it turns on across the dimensions of the chip is so complex that most of the equations are not accurate. And as you probably know, when you go into the lab, that FET always seems a little bit hotter than it was supposed to be. So we do classic inductive switching crossover loss here. It's, it's not resistive switching, it's inductive switching. And then we look at the cap discharge loss because that starts becoming important as the frequencies go up. And that's going to be one of the reasons eventually that we're all going to have to go to soft switching converters. I hope that explains that for you. Okay, so we've designed our L, we've designed our C, we've changed our output diode to a synchronous rectifier. And Notice if we want to look at efficiency again, we have to go back to steady state. Continue, auto scale. There's our output ripple in steady state. Look at the efficiency, and there we are with our 97.5% efficiency. Are you done with your design? Well, it's pretty good to me. I'm trying to try to get converters out there. I'm not trying to run on the bleeding edge of 99%. So some people, yes, you're done. For other people, it's like, well, that's not really enough because it's not really about the efficiency. It's about the three watts of power here that you've got to get rid of that power, All right? So that's not a lot compared to what's going out of the power supply. But this is where it's, it's very new in our field now. What people are pushing for in efficiency is changing rapidly in this field. And you have to make a decision. Am I done? Am I not done? Change the inductor. We're going to do a lot of inductor changing on the second part of this, but let's look at something on the inductor now. So maybe it's what he's getting at. What we've got here is a 22 microhenry inductor, 12 milliohm winding resistance. This is the top level design of, a, of, of, of the inductor. So you can go to a data sheet and you can try to find one of those if you like and you know put it in your circuit an off the shelf part or if you want to you can go into our inductor designer right here and you can build your own sometimes you can't find the one that you need the selection is pretty good these days 
But sometimes if you've got a strange input voltage, strange output voltage, unusual requirements for size and shape, you have to build your own. So we can build our own. So let's say it's telling us here we need about half a centimeter core area. We're going to pick a core. We're actually going to pick an RM10, which is a lot bigger than that, to try and go for some efficiency. And also because it's pretty close to this little inductor that we've got right here, which is a coil craft part of 15 microhenries. And for that RM10 core, it tells us we need 11 turns on it. This is what the gap in the core is going to be. So now we're digging into actually making our own inductor. And then we can look at the core material that's available. There's a whole bunch of core materials here. You see the loss is very low because it's a DC inductor. There's just not much going in there. As we change core materials, you see that barely moves. So core loss is not a big deal when we're operating for this converter. Look at the windings. So when you're making your own, you're probably gonna start using magnet wire because that's what you've got in your lab. And if you just try to wind it with a one layer of, of, of windings, you see you got 1.5 watts of loss, that's pretty bad. Click on the minimize loss here, and it says 0 0.5 watts of loss. Hey, that's pretty good. What else could I do? Well, I could wind it out of foil. I could wind it out of helical foil. This, this inductor here is helical foil. It's like a little spring loaded into the window of the inductor. There you can see that. That's not easy to do on your own, but the manufacturers have no problem with that. Let's put the helical foil in. And now we see we're down to 0.3 watts winding loss. You click OK. Go back to the schematic. Click on efficiency, and now you see we've got 98.24% in there. These losses now are the real losses from the inductor, not just some generic, here's the inductance, here's the DC resistance. This is now DC and AC resistance in the winding loss and the core losses in there too. So you can go down to any depth that you like, and we'll have another webinar in a couple of weeks about you know, plunging into the depths of winding design of inductors and transformers. It's a very advanced and uh, complex topic that uh, I don't want it to slow us, slow us down too much here. What if, well, we're gonna explore this a bit more. Let's look at this ripple current on the inductor again, sorry. Here's our ripple current on the inductor. Let's uh, zoom in a little bit and look at it. And remember the rule I gave you was 30%. And then many students that we've worked with and you read textbooks and you'll see this number, 30% or 20% or 40%. And the reason over the years I've been reluctant to give out equations is because in teaching these days, when somebody sees an equation, it's locked into their head. And they think they're stuck with this 30%. It's like, well, we've got 22 microhenries here. I'd like to use this part. It's 15 microhenries. I don't really want to build this myself because they make it cheaper than I can. What if I went down? There's 18 microhenries and there's 15 microhenries. Continue into steady state. Now we're looking at almost 40% ripple. Is that a problem? But a problem using 40% ripple? Well, not really. You just kind of look at the waveforms and you bump it down a little bit more. Is that a problem? Well, we're not gonna know until we dig into the winding designs, the AC resistance and so on. But this whole uh, construct of, you know, how much inductance we should, we should really use, there is no answer to that. So it gives me my little thing, it's my little trash can, okay? The whole point of the trash can here is uh, you take rules like this, here's your 0.3 ripple, and you tear them up and you throw them away. I bet you're not all doing this, but maybe you will next time. And you put them in your trash can because there really isn't a rule about how much ripple current you should have in an inductor. So this is one of the new things about designing for modern converters. The capacitors have changed so much 
the 30 percent ripple or the 20 percent ripple rule isn't there anymore have as much ripple as you like and assess the loss on that inductor but the capacitor can take it it's not it's not really a problem in the capacitor so we can reset that back and continue that's where we started drop that inductor current inductor value down every one of these designs is just fine and this was something that drove our graduate students crazy like there is no right answer there is no textbook there is no mathcad flow of design here in one situation this is going to be right another situation this is going to be right everybody's got a different value and that's why we can't pin down this entire design process for a uh, for a converter okay so what have we got now let's head on back to this We've gone through the ripple current, which we now we know we can adjust. We've got the resonant frequency. We chose the FET for 1% loss. We choose the diode for voltage breakdown current rating. And then to make it more efficient, we change the diode over to a FET for synchronous rectifiers and we bump the efficiency up. Are you done? You're done if you're done and you're happy with the efficiency and you want to get it out the door and power your system. You can tweak it to a standard inductor as we just did. And all, all of this to me is the essence of designing the power converter. You know, if it's isolated, it's the same thing. Last step, when everything is done, you find the controller that meets your needs. So I could probably find, I don't know, 200 different controllers out there that, uh, that, that, that fulfill the needs of this particular converter. You know, what kind of drive do they have? Are they happy at that frequency? What kind of bootstrap circuits do they have? You know, do they have synchronous rectifier driver in there? There's just so many control chips available these days that, you know, this is the easy part, choosing the controller and making it work. What do we have after going through this process? Well, we give you this design program you've got. So anybody designing a buck converter, you have all the answers at your fingertips now. We've given you a solid design. It's going to work, but it's going to look like these. So this circuit here, shown on the left, okay, is designed with this kind of approach. And then here's the real uh, circuit board. So here we have a PF. Sorry, I can't see my picture here. Here we have a PFC part, which remains pretty invariant for everyone because you've got to have the big, big hold-up caps here and the PFC inductor. Then over here, on this part of the circuit, you have the DC to DC converter, which is what we're talking about. And you can see the problem underneath the board are some pretty tiny semiconductors. On top of the board are these enormous magnetics. So there's a, in this one, this is a, I think it's a phase shifted bridge, but the rules are all the same. One phase shifted bridge here, a transformer here, and another phase shifted transformer there. Gate drive transformers and output inductors and capacitors. <clears throat> Here's a demo board from, <clears throat> excuse me, the Coilcraft. Uh, not Coilcraft, from Linear Technology. It's a really nice little buck boost converter that gives you up to 900 watts output. <clears throat> what do you have on the board? Some little tiny control chips here and monitors. Some power fets here. And the biggest part on the board is the, is a great big inductor here. So a couple of years ago, there were a lot of discussions about how the magnetics industry was letting everybody down, that we needed uh, new core materials, we needed new ferrites, we needed new something to solve this problem. And it's like, well, after 200 years of magnetics development, you can't have them. There really are no new ferrites. There's nothing better than copper. You're probably not going to use silver, even though it's a better conductor, because you're worried about cost. This is what you get on the inductors. Okay, so are we stuck in our design process? Is this an optimized design? Is this an optimized design? It's like, well, sort of, yeah, this one here is optimized for making a profit. You've got to get the product out the door quickly. Excelsis makes semi-custom type supplies where they can do a development very, very quickly for you. 
they're not going to try and miniaturize this because you can't afford it. Coilcraft, they've optimized this board to be a nice demo board. Okay, to throw something on there from Coilcraft, sorry, the linear tech board or analog devices, this is optimized to do what it's supposed to do. Is it ready for your product? Probably not. You probably have to do a lot of things on this, but it's a starting point. Okay, so we can't say they haven't done a good design job. Lots of engineering has gone into this. Lots of engineering has gone into this, and it's just optimized for different things. Another one for you there, Ray. Current sense and current sense and current sensors. Haha. <laughs> yeah, that's a good that's a good question. Let's come back to that when it's time to talk about the um the higher frequency converters because that is a big problem. <laughs> yeah. Current sensing is a big issue. So anyway, what do we see here? Magnetics. We got to do something about this. How do we get rid of this stuff? To move forward, we have to do more. We have to minimize inductive energy storage. And this is something that Dr. Chuck talked about. And everybody is talking about it, even if they're not explicitly talking about this. This has to go down. You can't have big inductors in your converter. LLC follows that philosophy too. It's like there is no filter inductor anymore. It's just a resonant inductor. You got rid of it. You made it as small as you possibly could. And then you have to move to zero voltage switching. Eventually, everybody will be there. Okay. And these two can actually go hand in hand with each other. You could reduce the inductive energy storage at the same time as you start to achieve zero voltage switching. You don't have to go to really exotic technologies to do that. Better custom controllers. We'll talk about that in a second. And new devices, of course. We're going to roll in some GAN in a minute. As you go up, so getting to the current sensing issue, if you want to shrink things and make them work well, you can't have voltage mode control. You can't be dependent on that LC filter because it's going to move into regions where we don't like it anymore. So we're going to have to address this current sensing issue and you know for, from a couple of viewpoints. One is protection and one is from the control characteristics of the converter. So we've got to change the rules. And rule number one of changing the rules is try to forget the rules. So here, we've got my trash can with my ripple current in it. Here's my equation for the frequency. Throw it away. No good. Put it in your trash can. Try anything. Resonant frequency, one fiftieth of the ripple free, of the switching frequency. Throw it away. Don't care. The loss in the switch used to make it one percent. That was the design rule. What do we do with that now? Throw it away. Make it as low as you possibly can. So all the design rules we have for building the basic converter are now sitting in our little trash can. The only one left: how much capacitance do you need? That's related to the crossover frequency, the step load that you have. And the crossover frequency is related to the switching frequency. If I want less cap, I go bump up the switching frequency, bump up the crossover frequency, then I can shrink my cap down. So let's all right, let's go do all that fun stuff now. Now we're gonna move into a new world. So here, standard design. If you know nothing about converters and you want a buck converter running, you know. 95% efficiency, everything is done for you. Now you say, okay, I want to move into the into the new world. So let's uh, same specs, put our specifications. We'll clear out our design and start over. So that's the first thing we're going to go do in here. And we click. Okay, sorry, forgot to click OK there. Let's get interesting. We're going to throw away the frequency equation that we put in. Let's put in one, one, two, three, one megahertz. We'll run this 120 watt converter at a megahertz. Click OK. Still a buck converter. OK. Check your waveforms. How's things going? Continue. There's our steady state waveforms. Our output capacitor has gone down from a couple of hundred to 44. Our inductor has gone down from 22 to 3.2 microhenries. Hey, that's a pretty big size reduction in doing that. What's our penalty? Efficiency. Efficiency now is down at 91, it was 98. 
where we've got losses, conduction losses, switching losses in the fat. Let's put our synchronous rectifier back in because we lost that. And 10 milliohms. Update. Okay. There we got 93%. Now we're going to go to our switch and make that 0 0.01 this time, like I'm supposed to. Update. Now we've got our 94.5%. We were at almost 90, I think we we're at 98.6% before. So the cost here is the switching loss. You've got 1.5 watts loss, 2 watts as a turn on, turn off, and then capacitor discharge loss in here. So, are you happy with the smaller design? Are you happy with the efficiency? You can just go to this higher frequency and do this efficiency and maybe you're okay. You can now look at bringing in some new technologies. So let's click on the switch here. And everybody's talking about GAN these days. And, uh, We've made it easy to bring the GAN in. These are some parts. This is an EPC part. And I've got the board here. So here's, here's a little uh, demo board from EPC with some GAN parts on it. And there's only one little part on here. You can barely see it. It's like three millimeters by four millimeters on there. Very tiny part. Let's click on that and load that one in. And now we're up to 97%. Okay. That's cool. Here's the power of GAN. It's got very low on resistance, much faster rise time, much faster fall time, that's the type I remember, and the capacitance is, is much lower on the GAN. So here we put our GAN in, 97.6%. Let's go back to the original. All, all we've done, you, you don't have this little button here to fill in GAN. That's something we developed actually yesterday. Um, so you have to type these values in yourself. Okay, we just made it a little bit easier for you. If we clear it, back to 94%. And then if we go to the EPC again, back up to our 97% on here. Okay, so that's the power of GAN. It's gonna switch much faster. It's gonna be easier to drive. We're not really counting the gate drive loss here, which would be substantial. We'd probably gain another half percent of uh, gate drive loss when working, uh, when working with the GAN versus regular FETs. And um, there you go. That's, that's why we put it in there. So that's got our efficiency up, but what about the remainder? How are people getting 99% efficiency? Well, you look, you see, we've, we've still got switching loss here, like 3.4 watts of switching loss. Conduction loss is low, but this is the biggest chunk. What if we go to two megahertz? Okay and make sure we're in steady state continue there's our steady state okay efficiency now we're down to 96 we're losing losing the efficiency again okay as we bump up the frequency let's talk about the induct oh i'm sorry on that efficiency you can see there's coming in, winding loss isn't too bad. Switching losses are much more than conduction losses on the FETs. Let's go look at our inductor current again. So here we are with our standard design. We're down to 1.6 microhenries. We used to have 22. All right, pretty good improvement. Should we make that inductor smaller? Who would you shriek it? It's 1.3, 1.9. 0 0.9, 0 0.75, 0 0.6. There's 0.5 microseconds, microseconds, 500 nanoseconds, 500 nano, nanohenries rather. Is this too much ripple on there? So now I've got two, four, six, eight, over 10. I've got 80% ripple to DC current. Most designers thinking conventionally will say, yeah, that's getting too much here. I can't, I can't handle that. I'm going to have higher conduction losses. You know, my switching losses are climbing up here. 
conduction losses aren't moving very much because it's such a good fat that really wasn't a very big number but the switching losses are climbing and then this is going down further what if i reduce my inductor further remember now we're trying to get rid of the inductor as much as we can shrink it down boom 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 continue now i've got 18 amps of ripple or 16 17 amps of ripple and 10 amps dc output so my ripple to dc ratio is now 170 percent so have we gone too far on the ripple i don't know if uh great anyone could put any comments on your questions here is is, is this too far have we got too much ripple just to try and get this inductor down to 0.2 microhenries or should we stop what if we go a little bit further and there you go we continue down and hit discontinuous mode at this point let's leave it a little bit above that right now so there's a little bit of current left there at the end now i'm violating all kinds of things if i look at my power stage transfer function current mode control and let's make this current mode selected make it voltage mode control voltage mode selected and um, that's a strange uh we form oh we're in discontinuous mode i think so let's uh bump up the inductor just a little bit right so now we've got this value inductor and we've got this resonant frequency which is only about one you know maybe one twentieth of the switching frequency we've violated this when we close a loop on that it's a horrible looking loop gain here it crosses over there but there's almost no gain here so the converter is not going to be able. Let's have a look. No, it won't saturate the magnetic core if we go higher ripple current because we designed the inductor. Remember now, you're not buying something off the shelf and you're constrained by what the manufacturer gives you. You go look at your inductor design. You look at the size of the core you're going to use and it tells you how many turns you need to not saturate. Okay, you, you, you don't freeze the inductor and then allow more ripple, you redesign, you redesign, you redesign. You always keep the flux density here so you don't saturate. Now, we might run into core loss that we want to add some more turns. But, you know, look how tiny this core is now. We're at 0.05 square centimeters. Before, we were at 10 times the core area, and then the volume is obviously grows much bigger than the, the area grows. So if the area is changed by 10, then the volume is going to change by 30, now we've got a chance of getting rid of that inductor. So here's where the crazy bit comes in. We're not going to dig into the design of the inductor anymore because we're running out of time here. But let's go to the waveforms again. And we take it to this continuous mode all the way. One more step there. Okay, there's our discontinuous mode. And then you go look at efficiency there and 93 94 it's not that good we've got seven watts of loss and it's all focusing on the you know there's winding loss there's core loss in the inductor we got to do something about that now so that inductor indeed has to be redesigned in there but what happens when you go discontinuous mode on the inductor here for a buck it's the same thing as a discontinuous mode flyback. When you let it go discontinuous mode, at the end of the cycle, it rings. And suddenly you get the opportunity to zero voltage switch in that converter. So you let the ripple current grow. You find a way to use that current here and here to soft switch the devices. So we can emulate that a little bit. So here we're at 94%. We say, okay, well, if it's going to soft switch, there's going to be no switching loss. So let's make that switching time really, really small. 0 0.01, and then make that capacitance really, really small. If we could eliminate our switching losses, we're back up to 95 and a half here. Got to go work on the core losses, which is causing some of that. Okay. So the design direction 
of all converters, really, the high density converters is get rid of the inductor. So if you're doing LLC, you're doing that soft switch. Well, what about the simple buck converter? Like, can I soft switch the simple buck converter? So I guess you can. All right. I don't know if any of you participated in building this, but I suggest you go do this afterwards because if you go put this on your boss's desk, you know, he might be a bit shocked. This here is, it's not a buck, it's a buck boost, but they make a buck as well. This is an 800 watt converter. Okay, 800 watts inside that package. How did they get there? This is from Vicor. Some of you will recognize the package. They got there by shrinking the inductor down to almost nothing and soft switching on the top and bottom. Here they have a little, this is a buck converter. They've got a zero voltage switch buck converter in here. They put inside here. I don't know what the power of this one is. Crazy pals, 300 watts maybe inside that package. Compared that to what we were here. This kind of thing is the future of where we're going to go eventually. This doesn't even have GAN in it, so it hasn't even arrived at the interface that it can go to. But that's the kind of thing people are doing, taking that induct value down, pushing it over to zero voltage switching. And in the long run, you know, 20, 30 years from now, there probably won't be any hard switch converters left. And it's not about the efficiency, it's not about the intensity, it's about the noise and the EMI. So in the end, soft switching is gonna win because the EMI is so much better on the soft switching. So that's, that's where we're heading. We're not all ready for it. Uh, we have a big problem. If I want to switch at you know 200 kilohertz, I can't buy a controller. Oh, sorry, two, two megahertz. I can't buy a controller to do that. All the analog controllers stop at one megahertz. Okay, nobody's really taking care of this space. We've got digital controllers coming along. They can handle higher frequency switching. Okay, they're running very, very fast, but you know, you've just jumped to a new technology. So there's a bit of a gap of easy to use controllers at the higher frequency. Do you have any snubbers on the circuit? Snubbers? Well, that's a really interesting question. So this is the little buck demo board from EPC. We've had long discussions with them about snubbers. And the rule on the snubber is, is you've got to shrink down your input cap, switch, diode configuration to get the leakage out of that loop. And you've got to raise the ringing frequency at the, at the nodes that you think you need to snub as high as you possibly can. And then the interesting technique they use that we've always used too in the past is you can either use a snubber to kill the ringing, or you slow down the rise time to be a little bit less, a little bit longer than the rise time of the ringing. So here they've got an enormously fast switching device, and there's a little resistor on here, and the resistor is to slow down the speed of the device to control the ringing. So people have been in path converter design for a long time. I've always known this, you put in a gate drive resistor, and you look at the waveforms, it's like, well, if I crank up that gate drive resistor, I can slow down the switching and it just grabs a hold of that ringing part. Because in reality, when you're doing these super dense converters, snubbers do not belong in there. You've got to get rid of the snubbers. So it's a control of the parasitics, the switching time, grabbing hold. So when we look at the, you know, this converter here too, this is the buck boost converter, same trick has been played here. Very nice job with the layout, very, very tight between the switch synchronous rectifier and the cap. And then they just slow down the switching a little bit that you don't need snubbers and you can't see any ringing. So that's, that's a really good question. It's still a brute force thing. You still got that switching loss going on and you've exacerbated it a little bit. But the snubbers can, uh, can actually go away when you do that. There's another question too that I meant to... Yeah, I can't, can't remember what the um, what the question was there. Um, so there you go. So that that's that's where we are as conventional design. We have a program here that does it all for you. Okay. Now, I realize over the years that some engineers don't like our tool because they think it takes away their toys. Because let's face it, when you're doing a design, the fun part is creating the topologies running the simulation, trying an L and a C and this and that, that's the fun part. 
Then you got to build it. That's fun too. Then you got to build a hundred. That's not so much fun. Then you got to do worst case analysis. Then you got to do EMI. And that's, you know, then you got all the paperwork and the continuing engineering. And that's, that's where the drudgery of, you know, power converter design, you know, comes in. So they kind of like to prolong the design phase is what I've seen. I've seen people spend a week trying to build a P-SPICE model or an LT-SPICE model because it's fun. <laughs> okay, we, we do a SPICE model for you and, you know, click of a button takes one second. It's like, well, you've taken away my fun. It's like, no, we haven't taken away your fun. We've sped up the tedious part, which is creating the model, and now simulate 50 different converters. So during the course of this webinar, while I'm talking to you and showing you power supplies, we have done, I don't know how many times I clicked the button on changing the L and the C, probably 20, 30 different designs in there. So you still have the fun time of design, but you get 100 times more work done. So when your topology comes along and your selections come along, you've got the right answer. And you had a lot of fun doing it because you're not dealing with the tedium of the design anymore. Um, I've given you some equations here. Always, always, I get the same question on equations. So here were a handful of equations I gave you. Okay, and everybody says, well, can we have the rest of the equations? How do you design the inductor? How do you design the quark? And I said, and then, um, I always ask people, well, well, if you had the equations, what would you do with them? I said, well, I'd put the equations into MathCAD, of course, and then generate a design. I said, yeah, but we already do that. And so I said, yeah, but I want to put it into my MathCAD. It's okay. How many equations would you like? All of them. Last time we counted, inside our program there's a lot of hidden sheets here that you can't see we have uh 4500 design equations for getting to the answer on these converters you really want those <laughs> i don't even know where half of them live anymore because a lot of it just evolves over time it's like okay we're going to choose this size core but if you've got this thermal constraint we're going to limit it a bit by this if you're using this size wire well we've got to put insulation in there so there's just all these multiple parallel constraints coming into the design, which is one of the reasons we choose Excel. Okay, laying out 4,000 design equations in MathCAD is crazy. Laying them out in Excel is very easy. You just put them all here and they all talk to each other and you can look at the lines linking them all together. But there's a crazy amount of work to do in here. And, you know, don't, don't you know, some of the students, please, you know, don't be on this constant search for the, the ultimate equation that gets you there. There's so, so many. And future, we're going to do some future design uh, webinars here where we're going to talk about the magnetics. We're going to go into the details of magnetics and how crazy convoluted, difficult it gets. And there is no way, you know, without program now, we can start thinking about this. There's no way to find the optimal design for anything because the math at each little step is, is just so many things coming together. You just can't optimize this whole thing because nobody even knows what the optimization function is anymore. You know, it used to be size, weight, efficiency. For many people now, cost is the optimization function. You know, that's it, that's it. Okay, okay, if you're doing cost, you can't play these games. You can't, you can't build things like these micro converters if, if cost is your only objective. So that's okay. So that's where our program is there for you. You've got to get to prototype quickly. That's what we're meant for. So when we do a design for consulting, when we do this in our labs, we expect to go from the specs of the power to a working prototype in one day. So we'll be measuring the real waveforms on the first day, and that includes building the magnetics. Okay, that, that's how fast we're gonna try and go with this. And then that doesn't mean you're immediately jumping into the drudgery part of the design and reproducing that. It's like, no, we're gonna build another one tomorrow and another one the next day, and we're gonna build you know, 10 different switching frequencies and inductor values and you know, different different arrangements and try different topologies very, very quickly. So it's a lot of fun when you work this way. I find it very liberating to let the equations go and let, to, let the computer handle it for you. Because when you're buried in equations, you lose the creativity of the of converter design. And, that, and that's really what we're about. We're not, we're not engineering to equations, boom, boom, boom. If that was the way we worked, then we would no longer have jobs. This is, this is a creative process that, that we, we all work on here. Someone wants to see that time button work again. Which one? This one? 
from Vicor, that one there. Okay, go to Vicor's website, okay? And these things are crazy. They're just crazy converters. This one here, that if you assembled it, the little box I asked you to send on page two, please go do that and look at it. And then say, okay, 800 watts. Oh, and by the way, it's not just a buck boost regulator at 800 watts. It also does the inversion for the next stage as well. And I noticed afterwards the little cutout that I gave you is a little bit too big. The real converter is here. Okay, so you're about 25% too big on that little fold up. So when I was when I was printing it out, I thought, no, I can't be that small. But then I found it in my lab. It had gone missing for a couple of days and I found it. So this is where we're all going. Power is going to disappear. Okay. And you know, tr try to be a part of this journey because it's a, it's a lot of fun. But get the drudgery off your plate first. That's what our program's going to do. You know, we're still going to build flybacks and little things forwards and things like that just, just to keep the product going out the door. Do that quickly and then you can go play in the coming world. You can go play with GAN. Talk to EPC. Don't try grabbing these EPC chips and laying these on a board yourself if you've never done it because you won't be able to do it. Okay, get the little demo boards and see what GAN will do for you. It's, 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 this, this is fantastic fun to play with. You have no idea what it's like to get these boards in and see how tiny these parts are here. And I'm not trying to sell GAN or anything. I just, I just think it's really cool that they've laid out these boards and they've taken the hard part of that design out of the way for you. So we do, I don't have one of my boards here. We, we have very similar things on the way we do our prototyping. We have cards about the same size that we prototype a two switch forward or a flyback or a two switch flyback. So it just plugs into the board and the hard part of the layout is done. But this is where the fun is coming in uh, PAL converter land. And um, it's not really research anymore. It's, you know, all the topologies are there design programs are there. It's all about building these things and trying these things and just tweaking those parasitics and getting it just right until you end up with some of these phenomenal packages that we have. Just the, same thing for you, the, the crossover frequency again? No, it's the uh, worst case analysis. Worst case analysis? I hate worst case analysis. <laughs> <laughs> Which part of worst case analysis do you want to know about? It's uh, without knowing all the equations, how can we do a worst case analysis? Well, you can't. I mean, nobody can do a word. Even if you have all the equations, you, you can't do worst case analysis because nobody knows what the core loss is. Nobody. Magnetics vendors don't know what it is. The data sheets don't know what it is. So the hottest component on the board often will be the magnetics and you have no data. So over the years, you evolve to, you know, your best guess at worst case analysis and you have to get it past the reviewers. Of that, but you, you can't take 4,600 equations and do worst case analysis. You take the essential ones. So, what's essential? What's the maximum flux in the inductor? You've got the equation for that. So, we give you those equations. But if you're doing worst case analysis on switching loss, for example, it's wrong. The worst case analysis is always wrong. You may satisfy your project lead that you've done worst case analysis. But when you go measure the real board, it's nine times out of 10, it's harder than you expected it to be. And the worst case analysis doesn't show you that. So experienced engineers, they do some worst case analysis, they run it through a simulator like ours, which does the analysis for you. If, you want, if you're doing through, going through this process, you say, hey, I need the equation for that. Sure, we'll give them to you, you know, just call us. But I, I, we can't give you 4,600. I don't even know where they are anymore after 30 years. You know, trying to unwrap all these equations is, is impossible. But worst case analysis is a, is a difficult topic. And I say the reason I don't like it much is because it's impossible. There is no worst case analysis on a converter. It's a combination of experimentation, analyzing the things you can analyze, you know, and then just putting an engineering judgment on the rest. This is an art form. This is not hard, you know, worst case analysis science. Okay. So. Yeah, sorry, that's not a good answer, but uh, that that is the real answer, I think. Any more questions, John? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll play some. Yeah. Uh, let's see. 
Does control of high efficiency converters get difficult due to resonant peaks? That's a good question. Okay. So let's look at our control design. You are using voltage mode control. And then let's bump us back into continuous mode here. Right there. Okay. And then here you see that we're still fairly damped. So this is our power stage and the Q is three. So that's that's fairly high. Okay, that's our Q of three right there. But that's a, if, if, see if we can make that Q a little bigger. Let's uh, drop this down to one milliohm on the inductor update. Okay. You are using voltage mode control. What's our Q now? Q is now 4.6. Now we'll go, let's go silly on the FET and make this a one milliohm FET here update and let's make it a one milliohm diode can you get those absolutely okay you are using voltage mode control all right here you go here's a high q power stage let's turn off the loop power stage details our q is now seven okay is that tough to control well it's getting there let's put the loop on now we're crossing over here, and then we're trying to make sure we pull up the phase here, but if that Q changes, if it becomes sharper, the phase is gonna drop down sharper, okay? So this was one of my slides earlier that said, okay, if you're really gonna push into this region and you're making a very high efficiency converter, and every, you know this, this is the thing of power electronics now, your know, efficiencies are gonna push up, they are gonna get to 99%, you know, that's what it is in the high power field, that's what it will become in our field. You can't have uncontrolled resonances anymore. Okay. What do you do? Go to current mode. Current mode selected. All right. Loop gain design, compensation design, piece of cake. Once you put current mode in there. Okay. There's no resonant frequency to see. We don't care what the Q of the resonance is because it's embedded in the feedback of the current. So as you're pushing to these higher and higher frequency, higher and higher efficiency converters, you've got to grab control of the resonance and you do that with an inner current feedback loop. That gets us to the other question somebody asked is like, okay, you've gone with this GAN thing here. I know you can't really see the GAN part on there. It's that kind of silvery blue part in the middle right there. Inside that one chip is the switch and the diode that hooks up to the input cap. You cannot measure the current through those devices anymore. You cannot look at the drop on those devices. There's too much noise and they're too low resistance. You know, that th th you can no, you no longer can pick up that signal. Does that mean I can't do current mode? No, you do observe a current mode. Okay, that's existed in the motors world and in any other control fields for many, many years. You look at voltages in different parts of the circuit, you process them, you integrate them, you do current mode through other methods. All right, so that, that's the next fun thing on your list is as you're pushing to these higher frequency converters, you've then got to do some much more advanced control techniques of current mode to, to get the waveforms clean, to get the feedback in there and to get rid of those resonant frequencies. That was a good, uh, that was a good question. Uh... Is there gonna be a webinar about flyback converters? Well, we'll run a survey afterwards. Would you like a webinar about flyback converters? I think we're gonna do lots of webinars actually. How can you move pole zeros to make your system? Yep, that's a great topic. We're definitely gonna do control. How do we compensate circuits? We say, okay, let's, uh, let's reset to a normal converter. Clear design. Go back to the beginning. And click OK. Come on. All right, go back to our control design loop. You are using current mode control. And let's go to voltage mode control. Voltage mode selected. There you go. It's voltage mode selected itself. Here's the power stage. Here's the loop. Let's just look at the loop now. Okay, what I do 
in the simulation software here and in the lab, I'll tell you why we do it in the lab in a minute, is I find out what the handles are. I find out what the handles are to move this loop and I push it around. So I will bump up. You can see here what I'm doing. As I click up on the zero, I'm lifting the gain here. And I click up that, I'm deter oops, you can't see the point. I'm deteriorating the phase margin when I push on that zero. Okay, so I'm just massaging around that loop and I can push the poles out a little bit and that buys me a little bit of phase margin back at the end here. Okay, I'm not thinking about optimizing this zero and the pole and the R and the C and this and that. This is a graphical process. And the reason I stay graphical, yeah, of course we could solve this, you know, find the best solution. But when you go in the lab, you know, and you, you bring in your measurement of the power stage, let's look at the power stage, prediction and measurement. And it's like, whoops, well, we didn't quite agree there. Okay. And then you find you've got to refine the model and you, you, you start doing this empirical work. Well, in the lab, you know, it just kind of does slightly different things. It's not as undamped as I expected it to be. The resonance has moved a little bit. So there's a lot of engineering that has to go on there. Applying pure math to it just doesn't make any sense, quite honestly. So we, we, don't, we don't try to do that. Uh, let's see. Uh, yes, you can upgrade Power 456 to Ridiworks, no problem. Somebody answered that question already. Isolated flyback converters with synchronous rectifier. Yep, we're absolutely going to do that. And in fact, when you, if you come to our workshop, which we will eventually hold here again in our new facility with social distancing and all that, you will build a flyback converter with a synchronous rectifier. That's one of the day's experiments. So we give you the specs, input, output specs, and you've got one afternoon to wind the magnetics, measure the magnetics, put them in the circuit, design the snubbers, and run the circuit, and then you replace the diode with a synchronous rectifier. We get all that done in four hours. And uh, we've been doing it for 21 years now, and everybody manages to finish inside that four hours. So we teach that fast design. But yeah, it's very important. The, the design of a flyback has gone through a similar evolution to the design of the buckle I'm talking about. It's coming, where you shrink the inductor down. You find most converters, flyback converters these days, there's just a much smaller primary inductance than you'd expect. And they take it into discontinuous mode. And then the clever controllers use the discontinuous mode to get zero voltage switching. Okay. Is that new? No, they used to do that in the 1960s too. The TV power supplies, the high voltage supply on a TV power supply always used to be zero voltage switching. So that's that's a fascinating topic and quite honestly nobody knows where the optimal design of a flyback is anymore they're all heading further and further into dcm driven a lot by power integrations but what if you need a 60 watt flyback can you do that well there's no optimal design where anybody really has answered that but uh you know it's a, it's a good topics for the future that's for sure what type of controllers do we use we use the ti controllers and we're just doing a new control board right now. And we, we go back to the ancient controllers. So we're gonna use the 3825 on our new control boards because you can do everything with it. It's got a great driver. You can switch voltage mode to current mode just with the switch of a jumper. You can change the current limit set points separately from the current feedback. You can change the blanking time with a resistor. It's got everything in there. Okay, so that lets you do all these experiments on that chip. So sometimes we'll use some of the, uh, you know, the PIC controllers as well, which are analog slash digital. But in, in our control course, in our design course, because the course is about building the passives, you know, we do two days on the control as well, but the actual choice of chip doesn't matter. You just want one that works well. That one works well. It's got a good op amp which can't be said of a lot of the cheap controllers these days. The op amps in many of them are just atrocious. So as you push out to a megahertz or more, you just can't run with the op amps that, that come with some of these controllers. So that's the kind of thing you're looking for. You know, I'm not looking for green power features, things like that. I'm looking for performance. So that's the, that's the control chip. Changing inductor size makes the cap bigger. No, nope, doesn't do that at all. Look at this here, okay? 
this is the linear tech board. There's the inductor size. And these are the capacitors. Yep, these are the output caps. Two electrolytics and one, two, three, four, five, six multi layer ceramics in there. This design has gotten completely out of whack. The capacitors are maybe 1 50th the volume of the inductors. So if you shrink the inductors down by two and the capacitors grow by two, they're still only 1 20th the size of the inductor. Okay. So the old rule of ripple. It used to apply to the old electrolytics of the 1980s that if you went 20% ripple, then your capacitor was physically about the same size as the inductor. And that's where that rule came from. The fact that it's still printed in textbooks today is like, well, it kind of dates that textbook to the 80s. As soon as the multi layer ceramics came along, you can throw almost anything at them. You know, you have to be careful thermally and cracking them and all those good things as well. But we've shifted, everything is shifting to getting the, the inductance down, the capacitance is going up to absorb the ripple current, but it has no problem. Think about the LLC. What is, how does the LLC work? Well, the inductor rings all the way up to the positive and all the way down to the negative. It's no different to a DCF, except it goes plus and minus. So the filter inductor has become a resonant inductor with lots of ripple current in it. All that ripple current just hits the output caps. And they can take it, no problem. That's what that's what that's what they do. So you look at uh, you know this one again. You know magnetics to capacitor size. The capacitors are very tiny. The magnetics are big, so the magnetics kind of need to shrink and let the capacitors grow a little bit. And that's using electrolytics. Now if they have multi-layer ceramics on there, some of those are underneath. You know the the, the it, it's out of balance right now. It's, it's completely out of balance where the caps have suddenly gotten so good they've shrunk to nothing. The FETs have suddenly gotten so good, you know, they were good 10 years ago, but now they've gotten so good that they just they just don't exist in the converter. And all that's left is the L and the C. That's what we've got to try to work down to uh, as small as possible. Any other questions? A lot of questions here. <laughs> yeah. MLCs have capacitance derated due to DC bias. So, yep, you have to take, you know, if you go up to the full rating on the cap, which you shouldn't do anyway, you've lost maybe 40% of your capacitance. So there, there's another reason to not use voltage mode control. So if this cap suddenly drops down to, you know, a much smaller value, you know, to about 40% of its value, you've moved the resonance. If that resonance is close to crossover, you're in trouble. Your loop's not going to be any good anymore. Okay. Of course, we're recompensating as we go here, so we don't see that. But you have to take into account the derating of the reduction in the capacitance. You have to go to the data sheets for the capacitor, and the data sheets will give you a curve. Will they give you a worst case analysis? No, nope. they'll give you a typical derating. So again, we're back to that worst case analysis. Hey, we can't even get a handle on the C's, how much they're changing. Okay, but you, yeah, you do have to be aware of aware of that uh, process going on. Will the LLC topology ever be offered in this simulation software? Let me tell you this. If you all go out and buy our full version tomorrow, we'll have the LLC in there in a few months. If everybody just looks at our software and says, well, that's nice software, but I'm not going to spend any money, then no, you're not going to get the LLC either because it won't make a difference. You know, the LLC is maybe 5% of the market. It's still mostly hard switching. Bicor is going with the soft switching buck. You can design that in there. I say, will we do the LLC? It's just resources, manpower. The more people buy the software, the more resources, manpower we'll have. We'll do the LLC. But I can guarantee you if we uh, did LLC tomorrow, the bump in uh, people using the software, people would still say, well, I want the equations, I want to do it in MathCAD myself. So <laughs> it wouldn't change the equation, which is part of the reason we haven't done it. Now, if you're an enterprising designer that knows our software well, you can certainly design the half bridge transformer ready for LLC, and you can massage the values to do that transformer design properly for you. That's a big chunk of the design for you. But you know, the choice of the switching frequency versus resonant frequency, all that stuff, obviously you've got to use the, the curves for doing that. 
So yeah, it's in the plans. We'll do it one day. It's up to you as our potential users how fast we get to that. Okay. Um, same thing as the phase shifted bridge as well. It's already in there. Phase shifted bridge is the same as a full bridge. Nothing changes. You just change the switching uh, timing. You know, going the sequence of the switches changes, but the topology, the design of the L and the C and everything else in the transform is exactly the same for the phase shifted bridge. So here's a good one. As experienced professionals, <laughs> do, do you people usually blow up your FETs as part of the prototyping process? If you're not blowing up your FETs, you're not testing it hard enough. Okay, so yes, you do blow up your FETs. <laughs> As you get better at design, you blow them up less, and that can be disconcerting because you know a power converter is just waiting to blow up for you, and you just haven't pushed on it hard enough yet. So yeah, if your FETs are blowing up in your prototype, that's your opportunity to move to the next level of reliability. If it hasn't failed yet, you haven't found the weak spot. And always, of course, the FETs blow up. They're, they're, they're the things to go. So when you do your board layouts, your board designs, make the FETs easy to replace because you will need to i make the controller easy to replace too because i you know too many times i've seen the controller die when the fet dies so that's a that's a fun question resonant converters in amc can i talk about that i could but i think we're out of time on this one is it possible to have a boost converter in soft switching yeah absolutely same way as the um as the buck the boost can be soft switching the buck can be soft switching the buck boost can be soft switching. That's what the Vicol converters are doing. Everything can soft switch. Again, it's almost 10 times smaller than 100 kilohertz. Of similar power. Right, so GAN is interesting in the, yeah, you can shrink the size of the die down and down, but you're thermally limited in the end. The beauty of GAN, which most people haven't realized yet, is that it doesn't have a package. <laughs> and when you look at it, it's kind of scary. It's like, oh my God, that looks like bare silicon or GAN in this case, GAN on silicon. And, and you say, I, I, I don't know how to handle that. I don't know how to deal with that. Can I touch it? That's, that's the die itself. It's like, well, yeah, you can. This is a little hidden advantage of GAN that's coming along. If you've, if you've been doing this a long time, this goes back to our earlier question too. When your FET blows up, the number one failure in FETs is usually the package and the bond wires. That's what goes first. GAN has removed the, the package and the bond wires. Okay. Then they've got the thermal conductivity down to the board. It's much, much better. So pulling the heat out is good. So they've got this demo board here. You know, it's like uh, five centimeters by five centimeters. The chip itself is three by four millimeters. What's the rest of it? Well, the rest of it large part, they don't say that, is heat sink. You gotta pull the heat out. So this is uh, at least a four layer board. So you put some copper in there and you gotta get the heat flowing away from that GAN part. But this is, this is a problem all of the parts are facing is that the silicon too is getting very, very small until it can't handle the thermal amount of it. So then it becomes about the package, about the heat transfer to the outside world. But if you can be that much more efficient in the switching, you know, there's less heat there. But heat, thermal, package size, all the rest of it is going to determine where all that goes. But uh, I, I must say, you know, using the old TO247, TO220 packages, you know, I, I'm kind of over that. You know, they're, 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 those packages have, have had their day in the sun. Planar converters, do they make the converter more efficient? Well, <laughs> what, is it, what is a planar? You know, when you look at a planar, they, they've got to have volume. It doesn't mean it's flat. Usually it just means you've turned, you've put the turns, you've rotated them 90 degrees, and then you just got copper in a window. There's nothing magical about a planar, except you pull the windings to the outside and you can cool it better, but it's not inherently more efficient. Let's see, EPC parts need heat transfer. Yes, they do, but they also got a heat sink option on top. Can you ex always explain why FETs blow up? <laughs> if we could do that, we wouldn't have any jobs anymore. No, no one can explain why FETs blow up sometimes. Um, you get bad FETs, you get bad packages, you haven't probed them properly, they're just marginal. Um, I, I had this problem in my very first design, early 1980s. We had some uh, FETs from IR, 
which didn't blow up. And then we had some FETs from GE, which did blow up. And it was random, painful, loud, dangerous, and we never ever knew why they blew up. So you shouldn't be shipping your power converter if you haven't gotten the root cause of why it blew up. But sometimes it can be handling. If you get a FET, you touch it, you blow out the gate. They're not all static protection, you know. It can be any number of things. You're overdriving the gate. There's transients that you're not catching when you probe it that may be destroying the FETs. Okay. But uh <laughs> let's see. I've got two screens going here. Uh any questions? Worst case, hopefully you got through that bit. Three phase, four wire flybacks designs. Now I've got some theoretical knowledge of those for three phase power doing flybacks, but uh, I haven't actually built any of those. Okay. All right, so we're at 11.30 here. I see we've still got 300 people on board. Let me just remind you of where we're going here. So we looked at the Vicors. And remember, Vicor doesn't isn't you know the only one doing this. So Ridley works, please go out. You're all at home, maybe sitting down, tell your boss you desperately need a copy of this to help you with work. Not only do you get the software, you get me and you get our team to help you with the software, which means we're helping you with the design, quite honestly. So many people send us the software. They've got a problem. They can't get around it. They say, hey, send us your file. You send us your file. You may have embedded your own data in the file because it's an Excel spreadsheet. You can open up new sheets and bid your stuff. We look over the design for you. You know, we don't even charge for that when we should. But you're part of our club when you get Ridley Works. And we're going to help you with your design process. Okay. So we have that. Of course, we do our workshops, which are kind of on hold right now, but we have some plans for that that we'll announce soon. We've got frequency response analyzers, top of the line analyzer for all you aerospace people. You need the mil cal, all the high power, high performance, very low frequency, the best noise. You know, channels are virtual grounded. They're not. They're not all hard grounded. So it just cuts through anything. Measurement is the AP. For those of you who are more commercial, we've got the Ridley box coming out which is going to start shipping in about two weeks. Um, that has got a computer in it, a lifetime license of Ridley Works, which means you're in our help club forever. It's got a scope in it, four channel scope. It's got a four channel frequency response analyzer. It's got a injection isolator. Everything you need is inside this box. And you just add your own monitor and keyboard to it and you're up and ready to go. All the software is installed. It's all talking to itself. We put LT Spice on there. We put PSIM on there as well. There's a special version of PSIM that we're going to have that comes with the Ridley box. So we do that. Come join our Facebook group. Yeah, I know it's uh, Facebook and uh, some people don't like Facebook, but this is the most active power supply design group in the world. We've got over 4,000 design engineers coming along with real problems. And we always announce our seminars. You know, when we do the webinars, we always announce it here first to this group. So come come join that. Just go look for the Pass by Design Center and the Facebook groups. And it's very, very interactive. A free book, you want to learn current mode? Here you go, here's current mode. If you want to know how to do current mode without measuring the current, you know, lossless sensing of current mode control, that's in the book too. So go download that from our website and come join our Power Supply Design Center. Lots and lots of articles in here, all practical things about magnetics and flybacks and you know anything under the sun. There's over 150 articles and videos in the middle of our design center. So output impedance of the regulator. Somebody asked that one. Yep, let me just take one second on that. Here, escape. You want the output impedance of your regulator. You go control design. You can all do this. Clip on Z out. There's your output impedance. Get rid of the measurement. So there's my open loop, output impedance. Here's my closed loop, output impedance. 
Okay, and then you know, in our lab, we bring measurements on top of this as well. So you can even do things like <laughs> you can do things here, like moving the zeros, and you can see how we push down the output impedance in there. So this is kind of fun to do. See how that output impedance changes. And of course, if you go too far with losing phase margin, see how that output impedance is starting to peak. See that right there? So you haven't actually reduced the output impedance by closing the loop, you've bumped it up because you don't have enough phase margin. So we'll reset that. So yeah, you can do output impedance to your heart's content. You can do line to output noise or PSRR, whatever you want to call that. And you can do obviously the loop. You are using voltage mode control. You can do the compensation. Everything is in there. If you want to draw a Nyquist diagram, I don't know why you would, but some people seem to want to. There's a Nyquist diagram for you. And we also export a small signal model, which will let you do input impedance, anything that you want to see inside LT Spice. So we set that model up automatically for you. You just click on a button and that will save you just enormous amounts of time in trying to figure out how to build the small signal models in Spice. We just do that automatically for you. It's just sitting right there, ready for you to use with all the values loaded into it. So all the compensation values are loaded in. We're doing every handout link. Uh, should be there, should be on somebody gave me that. Uh, yes, we're recording. Someone's asking, current mode in half bridge. <laughs> Car mode and half bridge. <laughs> yeah, well, yes, you can. Yes, it's tricky. If, if you go true current mode and you're doing your half bridge with split capacitors, you can't do current mode because if you balance the current to not saturate the transformer, then the capacitors walk. If you're doing a half bridge with two voltage sources, a plus and a minus voltage source, no problem. Current mode works fine. Okay. People are doing LLCs and they put current mode on the LLC. But of course, you're blocking, they've got just one input voltage here, and then they're using the coupling cap to create the half bridge. So it's a different way to do it. And yes, you can absolutely do current mode. You should always do current mode. You should always feed back some current. There's many, many, many different ways of doing it, but always grab the extra state variable, feed it back, knock out the LC filter, and life will be good. Okay, don't don't let that LC filter ringing. Once you've done current mode in your life, you know, I've never shipped a converter that wasn't current mode, you know, since the first time you do it. You just don't want to deal with that voltage mode design again. But you do have to learn the advanced ways of doing current mode. Okay, it's not it's not always that simple. You can't just put a sense resistor in there underneath the FET. These loops are so tight now. It's like, no, there's no no sense resistor. And you can't look at the drop on the FET. So these new half bridge modules from EPC, they've got the switch and the diode in one block. You can't even you can't even probe those nodes anymore and measure them. So you find other ways to do the current mode. And that, that's what the high power people do. They don't they don't cut into the switches and look at the currents there. They they move back a little bit and look from the outside and just assume there aren't problems like cross conduction going on that you know classically have given us issues in our converters. Any more coming in, John? What is the accuracy? Accuracy of what? Uh, I don't know what that question is about. Now, our simulator is very accurate. Okay, it's approximate. Every simulator is approximate, as is accurate as anybody's. Uh, DC blocking. I'm sorry? I'm answering the DC blocking question. Okay, good. <laughs> I'll get to the end here for the latest questions. Design. Does designing flat output impedance of the regulator make the regulator stable? You know, there are some people out there saying you should do flat output impedance of the regulator. It's nonsense, absolute nonsense. There's no reason to do flat output impedance. You just make the impedance as low as you possibly can across the, 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 the whole range. So this flat output impedance things, rogue waves, all this stuff you've heard about, yeah, I, I don't subscribe to that at all. I see converters with the lowest possible output impedance because you got to DC regulate. Okay, Sometimes you don't want to, to current share, but the objective of flat output impedance to me doesn't make any sense whatsoever. But, you know, that's where you want to go, that's okay too. 
how to do cross conduction current mode. Don't understand what that means. Soft switching. Yeah, I can do some soft switching. Blah, 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 blah. Core materials. Core materials, well, you just got to go look at them. You got to go look at the curves. There are no magic core materials out there. There's just a whole bunch of ferrites and they have different ranges and frequencies that they're good in. But nobody has collated all that data into one place and found the best one for every situation. We've come as close as anybody. If you go to our inductor design, let's go to the transformer design, just to do something different. And you look at core material, this is the only place in the world where you will find a magging material and a ferrous cube and a TDK all on the same sheet. And you can compare the losses from one material to another. Okay. Nobody lets you do that with their data sheets because they all plot different axes, different scales, different units, and you can't compare what's this one compared to that one compared to that one. So we, we do that all in one sheet. We would love to do more of this. We'd love to put every material in here. It requires, you know, TDK and Ferrex Cube and Mag Inc and the other vendors to participate and put some resources into it. So far, the, the response has not been overwhelming on that because they're kind of done with their cores. They, they got nothing new to say. They're just making, you know, pressed dirt in a mold for you. And there's just not the money to do this. And do they really want to compare theirs versus theirs versus theirs? Well, not really. So we're trying to do this. If you don't see the core material you want, get in touch with us. We're going to give you a little work and then we'll put it in there after you've done your little bit of work. Okay. That means you've got to look up the core loss charts, you know, to help you choose the right one. But there's no nice formula for saying, hey, I've got this application, which is the best core? You've just got to plow through the data sheets to find out which one's going to work for you. So, la, 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 da, da. any issues with analysis with variable frequency design instead of PWM? No, not really. If you go to our, you download this car mode book here? Okay. Click on the link and with our free car mode book and you'll have a chapter on constant off time constant on time converters so it doesn't have to be constant frequency constant on time constant off time works as well so no problem there the only, the only converter that's a little bit hairy is the llc nobody has yet done the closed form analysis of it and if you switch too close to the resonance it gets difficult what I see in industry going on is people do that thing and they just kind of give up on the loop. They just cross over at awfully low frequencies and the converter response is not, and it's not what it could be. You know, more work needs to be done on that. Uh, I don't know if anybody's going to do it, quite honestly. And then of course, after this page, you know, this is our new Ridley box, which is coming out soon. Uh, I'll be shipping to the US first, but this is all, everything you get inside the Ridley box. So lifetime license really works. Four channel frequency response analyzer, four channel, 200 megahertz oscilloscope, embedded computer. All the software is talking to itself. There's no setup. If you're in a lab where you're not allowed to talk to the internet, that's no problem. We can do a manual install of our software and nothing ever has to go outside of that lab. So we get you around all these problems with your IT departments of making these things work together. It'll be shipped to you with all the pieces of software already all talking properly. But that can save you a huge amount of time as well. So, well, we still got 250 people in the room. Any more? Any more questions? Is there going to be software to divine inverters? Nope. We we because we design, we have to shrink down to every detailed component level. So we've only got so much bandwidth for doing these converters. You know, we pick the ones which are the most popular. Can you turn your buck converter into an inverter? Well, probably, you know, will it help you build, you know, the models in LT Spice? Maybe, but no, I mean, nobody is going to give it has a design software for the inverters at this point. Okay. Well, I think that's it. Thank you all for attending. We will send a survey and please send us an email to. This address here, info at Ridley Engineering. If you have topics you'd like to see, 
let us know. Let us know how often you would like to do this. Uh, we're on a schedule of about every three weeks right now. Uh, and I've got enough to last for about 10 years uh, if you all want to keep coming. So there's just so much to convert a design to teach and you know the practical experience to get across to everybody. So let us know what you'd like to see in topics. Uh, come buy our software, help support us. That would be great. Get a frequency response analyzer, that's great too. And uh, we will see you all next time on our next webinar in a few weeks. Thanks, thanks for you all coming. Stay safe. Thank you. Excellent.